Hi all, uh, Tori Parsa here from First Peoples Disability Network. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, yeah, so I just want to start by um, giving an acknowledgement of, of country. Just wanted to acknowledge that uh, wherever we're zooming in from uh, this afternoon, that we are all meeting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, country. So I want to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to um, give a, a special thanks to Linda Fanukin, who's um, joining us as our Auslan interpreter and also to our uh, panelists that are going to be sharing their thoughts and experiences with us this afternoon. Um, we have uh, journalist, author, filmmaker, um, Jeff McMullen, who's um, going to be talking to us about his experience around pandemics and engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities over the, um, you know, his career. We also have Brian Tennyson joining us from Tennant Creek, who's uh, going to also share how we can engage our mob um, in remote areas. And we're going to also hear from Aquinas Crow, who's a, a young Aboriginal man with a disability living in Fitzroy Crossing. He runs a radio show and um, he's going to share of his experience um, as a First Nations person with a disability uh, living in remote communities. So I think. Um, yeah, I think we'll just cut straight to the chase and we have um, Jeff McMullen who's um, joined us and Jeff, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Wherever you are, you're all well and your families are strong. And I share Tori in acknowledging the custodianship of all of your ancestors in all of the different parts of the country. I'm on Gadigal land and there's a beautiful blue sky and it's a day like this that you can feel just how strong the country is It's singing to us and telling us, yes, we can all be well. Uh, in some parts of the country, people are doing it very tough and are isolated. And I think it's wonderful that the um, network that you've created today is bringing people together. It's a good time to, to look back, perhaps for us older people, at what we've gleaned about the human journey over so many years and to see that there have been other periods when things look very threatening uh, but the resilience of Australia's first people is an inspiration for me as a well-traveled global wandering man I always look here to what was learned over quite frankly, longer than anyone really knows. So even though there's a great deal of fear today uh, about the pandemic, if you look back through what your ancestors have led humanity through, I think you can overcome some of that fear and you can draw a great deal of um, strength and wisdom about how to see the beauty in every human being. Instead of fearing the other across the other side of the world, I think the mob here have always understood that humans are coming and going. Uh, we aren't the same. Every person is a miracle of difference. You know, even in our families, the personalities of our children and our old people, we're all quite different. Our minds are different. I don't fear that difference. I think that's something that we should see it as, quite frankly, it's delicious. It's like different fish in the ocean, different fruit on the trees, different bush tucker. It's all part of the mix. And, and here we have the recipe for the oldest, successful, multicultural, if you want to use that word, but it's deeper than that. It's different kinds of knowledge of seeing life itself in different ways, of valuing different things. But when we say the first people here were the custodians, we're getting close to what is probably my guiding principle that was shared with me as a very young person by Aboriginal people. As to how I came to work with remote communities and urban communities, 
and First Nations people around the world who were in a fight for survival really was handed to me by Aboriginal people, a responsibility to enjoin that work. And that responsibility was handed to me by my own mother and father, because our family story was in Ireland during another one of these great global periods of history when it looked like everything was finished, my ancestor, William McMullen, was seeing his family decimated by what they called the great hunger. We've had pandemics and great global famines all the way back through the human story. And so in the mid 1800s, William, at the age of 24, jumped on a boat and came to Australia. Now he'd lost his father uh, in that period. Uh, his mother and brothers and sisters would come later. But I know from our family story that by the time William was on a wagon heading to the bush in the Hunter Valley, where my mob grew up, Aboriginal people had been decimated by the pandemic of that era. Isn't it curious story that on the day when we looked to the anniversary of Cook and the Endeavour 250 years ago, we don't think too much of the well-being of the First Peoples at that time. But despite the contested views of how many there were, 300,000 minimum, maybe a million people or more, depending on which historian's view you accept, we know from very reliable accounts that before the arrival of Cook, followed by the First Fleet, Aboriginal people had a well-being that was based on custodianship, a long-term view of the health of the human family, and it accepted the differences within peoples and within the hundreds of nations here. We know from the observers, not only the English, but from Baudin, a French navigator that went around the coast in about 1802, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders were strong, tall, big, virile, men, women and children looked fitter in most cases than these travellers on the sailing ships. So the arrival of the pandemics before my William McMullen, my ancestor arrived, it was smallpox and influenza. And in the area where I speak to you now on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, Within 14 months, that pandemic, of course, took out about half of that population around the beautiful harbour, all the way up to where the Hawkesbury River runs down. People were huddled in caves. So the plagues have been with humanity for a very long time. What I discovered as a very young journalist in the 1960s was wherever I went, I came across that pattern. So in our bush communities in Australia, the devastation from the arrival of European-born illnesses had left scars on families to my lifetime. It was there in my own grandfather's story. Coming back from World War I, he was lucky to be alive, had two brother-in-laws killed in France, but the Spanish flu swept the world and decimated people, all kinds of people in all different countries. So, the connection for me was the change in the way humans were living, how we interacted, what we were doing within our place in nature, and how this contributed, where these diseases originated, came from two major factors. The old protocols that the First Peoples in Australia observed, which was careful avoidance, kinship systems, moieties, a very sophisticated sense of responsibility. So if you came into someone's country, as still happens in traditional communities today, you didn't rush up and kiss people on both cheeks and do handshakes and all of the stuff that became later, 20th century and 21st century customs, the very things we can't do now because it spreads the current coronavirus, the avoidance system of those old protocols so people would tell me, say at Utopia on Western Aranda land, of the care of the contact. So first you ask, 
how are you? Are you well? And as the men conversed on the fringes of camp, the women sat in groups, the children were quiet. There wasn't a rush and a mingling and let's get down the business in the first minute. It was the art of listening and finding out and respecting. And to shorthand my global learning, when that breaks down through invasion, dispossession, racism, massacre, genocide, of course you shatter the recipe for human well-being. When you congregate human beings in cities, when you settle and farm in the same places, instead of nurturing and living in balance with the seasons of the land, you set up what many historians have called the greatest mistake in human civilization was that over congregation. So I saw as I wandered the world this pattern. In the 1970s, with the Four Corners cameraman David Brill, we were looking at genocide against the first peoples in the Amazon, but killing them faster than the Brazilian commandos in the helicopters was disease. That epidemic was malaria and measles and those people had no resistance to what missionaries who were carrying in the bible to share that book with the people in those remote communities and i saw in a family there the tragedy that family the children of a man named Teru understood everything in their universe, but they had no idea of the health threat coming down that trans-Amazon highway. And I saw myself in Taru. It was just like my ancestor William, when the great hunger hit them in Ireland. They lost two million people, two million in a tiny little country. And he lost his father. And I could put myself in William's shoes, just as I could in Taru's shoes. And I think, I went on doing that wherever I roamed. It wasn't for what I did as a storyteller. I think it's more to work with people in different places of different languages and different ways of seeing. It's really the art of listening. If you listen, I found the brightest people on earth that I met everywhere were actually very interested in finding out, is there anything that I had that would be valuable to them? And I found also with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they would give me insights that I'd never gleaned from a book, at school, university, or even through what was my professional work of trying to tell a story about a place. It was to settle and be quiet. It was just to let the country sing to you. It was to take the time to understand what you were seeing and to be guided on what was their sense of well-being what really made them feel happy why did their children laugh and my son who was an adult was a little boy and we we're in a community called Minieri and he and his sister had grown up traveling to remote communities, working with Aboriginal doctors, with health clinics, with schools, lending a hand where they could. But this little boy said, why are these kids so healthy in, in Minieri? And I said, that's why, son. The old man, Stephen, sat at the school every day. He knew what well-being was. It wasn't a Gubba school, and the clinic wasn't a Gubba clinic. It was their community. And old man Stephen's daughter, Michelle Gibson, was a teacher. And she married a white fellow who was an ex-AFL um, coach, uh, Neil Gibson, who became a great principal. And my theory is old man taught his daughter, who taught her husband, it's not about black and white, it's about listening. And are we really going to learn from one another? Are we going to grasp the ancients understood in many ways so much about custodianship, the long-term view, not of what is just best for me or my little, little family, but the big human family means you have to be responsible 
And you also, in those places that don't have all of the trappings, all of the support systems, you've got to recognise that there will be people who will be struggling to have the opportunity to tell you their story, to let you know what is it that worries them? Why do they feel sick in some way? Is it a physical thing? Is it a mental health issue? Is it something we don't even have a name for? Because that's what I learned in remote communities. I was seeing conditions that I had never known in any Australian city, like acute rheumatic heart fever. I was seeing behaviour of children that I could see involved a disturbance, but no one seemed to have a name for it. And along the way, I discovered it was fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Beautiful children who had both a bit of the angel and the bit of the devil. They could be very violent kids that would disrupt the school, their own family, uh, make life hell for mum and dad and uncles and aunties. But it wasn't in their obvious behaviour. There was no clue as to what had made this child behave that way. And I think it took people decades to understand that in the great disruption of life, it wasn't only the interruption to diet, it wasn't only the arrival of all of the contaminants of Western society that threatened the indigenous knowledge system and contested everything that these people held as so sacred and dear, there were white man's poisons. That's what I call them still to this day. You know, I came to actually see that things that my own father had normalised that were damaging to his health, like grog, alcohol, it was a toxin. I'd never actually ever thought of it that way. I thought it's one of the pleasures. It's one of the things on the table that people enjoy. But I didn't connect it immediately with mental well-being. I didn't understand until I saw the assessments in certain schools and in the juvenile detention centres that children had been sent to jail when in fact they had an unrecognised disability. Not for their crime, but for behaviour that no one could understand. And here we had this situation where even the judges in some parts of the country were saying, I don't want to send this kid to jail as the law instructs me, but this condition is not recognised as a disability. And that is a pattern of human history. We often demonise people. You know, we mark certain groups in certain things. We, we put people on islands and keep them away because they have something that someone else has carried to them or something comes up out of that disruption as I see it. Viruses literally come out of overclearing a forest and arrive in a village. I witnessed that as the youngest ABC foreign correspondent to ever go to Papua New Guinea in the 1960s. And I saw it around the world where living close to this disruption, viruses that seem to have a natural pattern in animals, in bats, in birds, in pigs, uh, were crossing over into this congested human lifestyle. And yet the consequences of disruption and of this 20th century and now 21st century behaviour, we often don't have the right language. We, we blame, we're fearful, we accuse someone, but this is a human story that we're watching. It's a consequence of what the ancients understood, the breakdown of custodianship. When life is out of kilter to this degree, we stop seeing the beauty of difference and the individuality. We stop ac accepting that there are now seven to eight billion people who are all, each individual is different. And we go into fearful tribes and we start closing off. Instead of understanding there is a way in the ancient practices of respect, avoidance, and very complex protocols of behavior, 
in fact, give us a very wise remedy for where we are today. So in my dealings with people in remote communities, I started only seeing the child, the woman, the man. Uh, I was more interested in listening to their explanation for what was occurring in them. And I tried to bring that approach to every human I met everywhere on earth. Um, I became the patron of many groups working with people because it was just lending a hand. It was listening. Uh, it was something, as I said at the outset, that my mother and father had taught me. Why I was handed that responsibility is when my mother was a child, living on the edge of a shanty in the bush town of Singleton, Aboriginal people had been decimated in the period before the first McMullen ever set foot in the Hunter Valley. And yet my mother asked her father why the Aboriginal kids that she grew up with, she said, why do my friends, why can't my friends go to the school? She walked across the paddock barefoot to this little one teacher schoolhouse. And her father said to her, that's the way it is. She told my brothers and I when I was growing up, I said to my father, it is wrong. And I understood that that is where each one of us has a responsibility. We have to listen first and find out what is it in a, a remote community or in the suburbs. I have as many precious friends in Aboriginal homes and on Torres Strait Islands, in the bush, in very far flung isolated places, but also in the cities and the pattern of health and the struggle for individuals to explain their story, to not be tied and crippled by someone else's view of who you are, but to actually express yourself is really a very widespread occurrence. And so from Down syndrome people, I learned that there is uh, an amazing spectrum of behavior. There is a, uh, an ability to see the world without all of the usual envy and jealousy and guile that a lot of people have. Uh, you find that in groups of people that have been tagged as having a disability, in fact, they have an extraordinary ability to be able to make you see the world in a more joyful way. I saw that with people who could not see with their eyes. I met a boy in Kazakhstan who'd been irradiated by the Russian nuclear tests and he had no eyes in his sockets. But when he had told me the story and his mother had told me the story, he had an old record player and he would get these old commie Russian records and his joy was music. And before I left, I found an old beatbox in the local village and some tapes so he could listen to music from around the world. And Birik, that boy, was like Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder. You couldn't sit with those human beings and see this as a disability that meant something less in the human being. You saw that what we called the disability was a word to try to describe one of the aspects of their nature that made them individual. Individual, different, yes, but we're all that. But could I play like Ray or Stevie? No way. Uh, I watched Ray Charles work his panel in his studio. I mean, a thousand buttons on a desk in front of him. Stevie Wonder could shoot pool and sink a ball in the cup more accurately than I could seeing that cup. Uh, how he did it, you'll have to ask Stevie. But my point is, it's how we interact with one another. Uh, with the First People's Disability Network, my connection and becoming a patron of this wonderful group was really through the invitation from June Reimer, through the nudging in an interesting way from Daniel McDonald, a man I met as an artist. And I found out that Daniel was working as a New South Wales health worker, but he had this amazing ability to tell his story through his painting. 
So I think if we stop fixating on things being broken or less than or whatever, and actually listen to the story, the person doesn't have to speak to you. They may not be able to see you. They may talk with their hands through signing. They may have to use a computer keyboard because they don't have speech. They may live in a place where you're not even sure as you sit with them how much is shared and understood. But in that human effort to be together, to share your humanity, to, to realise that you learn far more from these people. Every one of the people I've mentioned to you has left a deep learning in me because it's that deep listening. It's simply seeing that all of these issues, we can make the judges in the court realise that children who are being sent at the age of 10 and 12 into a juvenile justice system are not bad, they are not criminal. Many of those children, if you look at the Banksia Hill study in Western Australia, many of those children have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. It's just an example, it's a phrase. What I'm urging people to do in the remotes or in the city, listen, learn, find out what is it that this person in their anger, sometimes in their violence or in their brilliant creative ways are trying to say, I am here, I am a human being. Don't judge me, tag me, don't bag me. See my humanity and when we sit together in that way, the, the remedy, the singing of the country, the, the bird song, I sometimes for my own state of mind, stop and listen to the crimson rosella that will sing in a tree. I, I can laugh or I can watch a joyful, a whale breaching or a dolphin in the wave just some little thing, just take a beat sometimes, instead of being overwhelmed by the pandemic or any other thing that's coming down, think for longer than any of us knows, your mob, the first peoples of this country have shown us how to be human. It's the greatest success story in the human family. And I think it guides us as to what we do, how we lend a hand, it's a very small part of a very big story, but it's a beautiful story. I'll hand over to you then, Tora. Yeah, Jeff, yeah, thank you so much for sharing um, your insight, experience, and, um, you know, I think myself and probably most of us here attending uh, this afternoon grew up with you, um, on our screens, TV, as you traveled the world and um, shared the stories that you did um, on different programs. And, um, you know, there was so much, um, I guess, just wealth that, that you brought here uh, this afternoon. So thank you very much for that. And also providing a new perspective, you know, I think um, it's great to, um, to, I guess, really just step back and, um, I guess, to sort of paraphrase what you were saying is just a kind of chill out and um, just learn to relax and observe rather than just get caught up in the hype of, um, of different things. So yeah, once again, thank you, Jeff, for, for your contribution this afternoon, much appreciated. Um, so maybe Jeff, we might just keep you around for a, a few minutes if um, anybody has questions, if that's okay. Um, you can send them through the Q&A uh, panel on your screen there, just um, type in a question and um, that'll, that'll come up. So that'd be great if anybody has any questions. Um, also want to welcome um, Michelle Bates and um, Brian Tennyson up there in Tennant Creek. I see you've, um, you've joined us. So hello up there. How are you? Hello, Tori. Hi, everyone. Hello, Tori. Hello, everyone. Hello, Brian, Michelle and Linda. Uh, yeah, Jeff, I just got a question from Demetrios. Um, he asks, um, do you have any advice of how to change the story of um, disadvantaged communities? 
Well, that's like the word disability. Um, we, we, we struggle through the years and use different words and then we reject those words to describe uh, what is actually happening. You know, it, it, it comes from even on black and white, uh, uh, American Indians, Native Americans, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people, First Peoples. Uh, I, I think sometimes the words and the tags uh, get in the road of just being together and, and finding out. But a word like disadvantage can be an explanation or it can be a pretty crippling bit of baggage, you know? And so I think it's more trying to explain to people that there is a very old pattern that if you look to the, uh, the history that we're discussing today of how people that have been invaded, had their land taken away, had their language denied, uh, were herded off into missions all over the world, that pattern created what we try to sum up in a word called disadvantage. But disadvantage doesn't explain how across generations of real families, uh, you know, a mental illness can be handed on. You know, how despair, how if you have suicide in the family chain, you know, if any child knows of a cousin that has taken their own life, how this flows on. Disadvantage, you know, it's such a, a, a hollow kind of a tag. What I know is damage that is done to human beings is carried on for a very long time. Uh, it, it, even now during this pandemic, all of the expert science, but also the wisdom of the elders, is trying to explain to the government that people who have been impoverished, who have overcrowded houses, whose diet is not good, uh, who've been damaged by all of those white man's poisons that I've listed, as well as sugar and processed flour and all of that, uh, the well-being of such families, summed up by what we call disadvantage, is many, many, many times worse for them during something like a pandemic. Just today, I heard a medical scientist saying that in Australia, uh, impoverished people will have probably 40% more uh, cancer. Uh, I mean, you can pick any illness on earth and you see, I saw that in the areas of famine, uh, in the war zone. I went to about 30 wars. And what terrified me was you would see two countries fighting, creating that disadvantage, uh, while they couldn't even feed their own people. They were slaughtering one another. Or genocides by people of the same skin, belief, whatever, but some political uh, group had all engineered this terrifying culling of one another. So there's all kinds of disadvantage. The evidence is, however, that deep set poverty sets up the health trap that we have in Australia. All of those, those words like the gap and closing the gap and so forth, they don't come to grips with the reality, which is across generations, the mother in the, in the, with her baby in the belly, her malnourishment, uh, her uh, lack of medical care, her overcrowded housing will affect that child even before it's born. And some of those effects of abuse, so alcohol abuse can affect not only the little girl in her belly, but maybe the next two little girls as that child. It's quite extraordinary how really disadvantage is an ongoing wave of trauma, of sadness, of loss. I personally see it more in going to funerals, those endless processions of funerals of people dying too young, or seeing children who have a disability that is not recognised and then going into jail via juvenile detention and possibly taking their life and then watching that carried on in a family. Uh, the question that you ask is very wise, very enlightened. We only change it by seeing the humanity of those around us. 
we can't separate others from us. We are a human family. Scientists call it a species. I think the Aboriginal mob understood that family is the glue that holds it all together. It actually holds our species together. So to end disadvantage, we've got to open it up and, and walk in the shoes of the mother and understand. Don't judge her and lecture her, moralise about her. Understand how can she give her little unborn girl in her belly the same opportunity that every one of us would want for that child. Ending that, changing that, that's when you take it on as a responsibility. And I think then instead of seeing it as, oh, well, people, you know, how many millions around the world live in disadvantage? We have no excuse for that. We have all of the wealth of creativity in the human family to deal with this. But we've got to value each life, not see and fear uh, or decide that certain parts of the country will have the privilege and others won't. You know, when we say health is a human right, it's perhaps the most fundamental one. So I think of that unborn child and how do we create the well-being around that? What are, what are the aspects of this disadvantage? Uh, I know the reality. Having slept in those homes that might have 20 to 30 people jammed into a sweat box when everyone's lying on a mattress, uh, how can you create well-being with such disadvantage? We, we have to spend the wealth of this country on the well-being of every child and that flows through then into the well-being of the family. I think your question about this advantage is the central unfinished business. It's far more important than the politics of equality. It's actually recognising the humanity at stake because we're all connected now. Our well-being is a human family well-being and we have to address that complex disadvantage as if every one of these members of the family is us, our, our family. Yeah, great thank response. You for the question. Yeah, thanks, um, Demetrios, and thank you, Jeff, for, for your response. I think we have one more question, and then I will hand it over to, to Michelle and uh, Brian. I know Demetrios just writes, um, thanks, Jeff, I agree language is powerful, and we need to pay more attention to it and go beyond those tags, as you said. I listen to people's stories and understand, learn from history, connect the dots, see the humanity in others, value each life, take responsibility to change things as we are all connected human family. Totally agree, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I don't think there's any more questions to come through. So yeah, I'll just hand over to uh, Michelle and Brian over there in Tony Creek. Thanks again, Jeff. I'll be listening in. Cheers. It's our turn, Brian. Yes. <laughs> We've got a few minutes. We should just check if everybody can hear us. Yeah. That's good, Michelle. Okay. So, greetings from Waramangu Manu. Manu being a Waramangu word for country. And I'm going to briefly introduce myself, and then I'm going to introduce Brian and ask Brian a couple of questions that relate to our topic today about remote life and the remote experience of people living with a disability. Um, I am a member of the FPDN team. Um, I've lived in Tennant Creek on Moramangu country for about five and a half years. And uh, I undertake some project work um, and uh, systems and individual unfunded advocacy, of which there's plenty in Tennant Creek in the Barkley region. Um, I'm also a narrative practitioner. And so my great love is stories. Thank you, Jeff, for helping to um, grow me up and contribute over the many, many years. Um, and that love of stories has continued in the people that I have met and come to love in Tennant Creek. So now I'm going to introduce you, Brian. Mr. Brian Tennyson was born in the 50s 
in a station about two and a half hours from here. Yes, southeast of Tennant Creek. Southeast of Tennant Creek called Kurundi Station. And Brian, you are an Awaramangu man, but you have many connections yeah. because you were raised by the Aliwara tribe. Yes. And your culture and your connections to people and family are very, very important to you. We've got some co-hosts who are going to pop in and out. Um, what I know about you, Brian, is that you are a thinker, you are a reflector, you are a man who reflects, you are kind, you are a man of faith. And what I've learned from you and your wife, Kuman J. Charles, is that one of the most important roles in your life has been that role of carer for your wife yes. for 13 years. 14. 14 years you cared for your wife with a disability. Yes. Yes. So I'm I'm thinking, would you like to add anything to that introduction? Well, yeah. I really really like to add um, because even though I'm Waramuna, but I've got a connection from Alioa Kaidi, Nigeria, and Walpi through my father, mother. That, that connection that we have in, in the Northern Territory is through by our common spiritual affiliation the primary responsibility based on our land. Our grandparents, they, they were taken away from their homeland and we found ourselves in, the, in Tennant Creek and mainly with Warbra. We, 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 I grew up at Warbra and went to school up there and then um, when, when I when we came back from the I, I moved out of um, Warbra and then came to live in Tennant Creek and that's when I started working with the uh, Northern Territory Health Department in Tennant Creek. And then when Anyanganyi Congress took place, so I moved out to um, Jalalakai Council of Aboriginal Corporation, which I worked as a young council member at the age of 32. And I learned about planning an infrastructure and looking at how people can find a uh, place for people who are homeless and who, who comes into Tennant Creek for doctor's appointment and then learning how to communicate with uh, I don't know how many tribes here, but um, I did I did um, counselling and got involved in working as a community development officer at Injulalikai organisation, and then after that I started working. In 1994, with um, ATSIC, we looked at many houses to be built in Tennant Creek, and then we found even my wife, we worked with the um, Jalalakai Council, but later on, she, she was. 
disability then, and then when I was working at the ATSI, and then uh, people, we, we found out people that had uh, a problem with being diabetic because um, that's when my wife became disability and then um, I had to stop working and had to look after her for 14 years and then after that when she passed away back in um, she passed away in June 18 on the day 18 6 2018 so I, I, I did I still like to work with them Michelle and help my other family members and relatives in Tennant Creek. Mm. Some, of, some of those people that you help, um, what can we share? What do you think is important for people to know when they're trying to help someone who lives with a disability in a place like Tennant Creek or the Barclay, in a very remote area? That's right. What do people need to understand? Well, people need to understand that uh, to me, I see that um, NDIS and in any other Aboriginal, uh, not only Aboriginal, but uh, disability that uh, working in Tennant Creek, we need to sit together. And I like to see the Northern Territory Government and the Commonwealth to come and sit down with the Aboriginal people in Tennant Creek so that we can tell our story and why I see this because it's it's important that our people need to be respected, even our children. Because some children they they're on go to school and I think we, we need we need the government to come and sit down with us. And then we can talk about how we can help children and disability because they come as a first priority for me to show respect for our people with love and care for one another. So I think that, um, and I think and I believe that we should we we need someone to come and sit with our people in Tennant Creek. And discuss more about um, children and uh, other dis uh, disability people who are aged care. Because I got my grandson and he's a, he's a child that is um, on a wheelchair for life. So these children need support. Mm. How can we help them? How can we share our message to bring people together to work and to live in Australia. Mm. One of the pieces of work that you do, Brian, is that you lead a group here in Tennant Creek, that Disability Matters group. Mm. And that's with your role with being the chair of the First People's Disability Network, Elder yes. Group, Elders Living with the Disability Australia. Can you talk about some of the things that Lionel, Combeef, Elizabeth, James, Amy, what are some of the things that they talk about that they need to be different here in Tennant Creek to 
people with a disability? Well, I like to say that um, the Commonwealth Government and the Northern Territory Government should have come and set up a conference for Aboriginal people to raise the issue in their community. What, what would you want those government mob to get on their plane and think about and talk about? What would you want them to learn here? What well, messages? Well, what, I'm, what I believe from my heart that um, the Commonwealth and the Territory Government should set up a planning and infrastructure for people who have disability and with the wheelchair access with transport and to make uh, to get these other people who are who haven't got any future in Tenant Creek because there's only one street here and I think that by setting up a planning and infrastructure of housing and uh, work to be done in, in the community are uh, doing a municipal job and doing night patrol to stop vandalism, stealing, uh, people walking drunks on Main Street. We had few people got run over here in Tennant Creek. And it's very sad, you know, if we if we're going to let this thing happen, I think the Commonwealth and Territory Government need to listen to senior elders of their tribe to come and sort things out. Mm. It's interesting that I hear you say that over and over, and I always remember that that government mob set up a trial site here in Tennant Creek. Yeah. And you would think that in the trial site, we might be one of the places that are ahead in our support of people with a disability, but it hasn't quite worked out that way. You mentioned housing. There are in town stories of families, four or five family members living with a disability, with wheelchairs, with specific needs, yeah. living in a house that doesn't have a ramp or access, the wheelchair doesn't fit in the house. That was a similar problem for you and Kuman Jay, your wife. Yes. Would you like to share with everybody some of the things that you learned when you had to advocate very hard for your wife and yourself to get her what you needed? Yeah, I tried hard with my wife. And even though we had to go from here to Alice Spring for Doctor's Point, and we didn't have any vehicle, how can a person with, without legs can find a way to go to doctor's appointment and um, there's no other transport there. How far is Alice? Five, 505 kilometers. And it's very hard for uh, people who are disability on the way down to Alice Spring. And when they get up, when they get up to Alice Springs, we have a problem with um, there's no liaison, Aboriginal liaison to get someone off the bus and take it down to uh, the hospital or to a place where when we booked in for accommodation, we have to get behind the wheelchair and push people back to where the accommodation is. Mm. So, and it's a, you know, there's a lot, lot of traffic up there in, in Alice Spring, even even though Tennant Creek is a small town, there's a lot of cars going in and out. And not, a, not a lot of pathways. Yeah, and uh, not a lot of pass, pathway to get, um, get to some of these areas. So pathways are, damage and you know sometimes people fall off the wheelchair. 
before we finish, I'm wondering if you can remember those times when you and your wife worked with support workers. So services come to town and they have support workers. And we know support workers are such an important yeah. role, sometimes the most important role, because they deliver the support straight to the person. That's right. What, what, what advice from your learnings with you and your wife, what advice would you give to services and support workers? How do they start to work with someone in a remote area? To look at the starting point. <laughs> the starting point. Yeah. Do you mean find a starting point? Or you know what the starting point is? Well, really to find a starting point. Yeah. I know only a little bit because I heard my granddaughter. She was working with, um, she went and studied in other, uh, Adelaide. And after that, now, I don't think, you know, she's working and she, that's how she told me to uh, look at the starting point by getting young people to study mm -hmm. and to train where the a place like um, PPK in Tennant Creek, and we don't have local Aboriginal people working in there. Mm, that's the aged care facility. Yes. Mm. And lots of people with a disability who aren't old have to go there for their support. Because there's right. nothing else. Yeah. So we need we need um, a plan from a big organization such as um, First People Disability because when I first went in and got involved, I learned a fair bit how to look at making a plan, planning, planning an infrastructure for our people in our community. Mm -hmm. So why just put a young man on woman after they finish their school and just walk on stray in town without a job. Mm. They need to be a place where they can they can go on by looking at how to when they come back to their own hometown they can uh, work with the Aboriginal organization and to learn from Aboriginal organization or they can go back and learn their culture within the country and or get, get other places such as at Yindamu where they got that um, for petal sniffing and things like that. I think that we need to look at that sort of thing there as well. So I'm hearing you say that a good support worker or a good service makes a plan with you, yeah. finds a starting point, yeah. and maybe am I also hearing that that starting point might be different for different families, yeah. different communities? Mm -hmm. And what else about a service provider would make you go back to them? Who would you trust? What would they, you don't have to name a service, but I'm thinking about what does a service have to say or do that makes you think, ah, oh, I might have a connection with them because I think I can trust them. What would they do or say to you? It's a service provider. Yeah, or a worker, disability worker. Well, I'm looking at, but what I'm looking at, what, I'm, what I believe that uh, when I got involved with um, First People with Disability, it's a place where people can be trusted with where they go and find support. People end up getting this diabetes because the starting point is from the health side. Mm. And when you're talking about health, you can get housing involved. Mm. 
and then from housing, you can you can um, train people with the language center. The language, language they can speak with their own language for their own tribe. You know. So it you know you've got your local people working. There won't be any racism or uh, because. You know, when you've got other people working in them, they come from different countries. And because of their rules and condition to the organization, we need to look at that um, to, we need to educate our own people with our, through by our own language. And we trained our younger kids as well when they go to school they have to learn their language because our language was the first language in Australia before the white settlers came in here. And now we are we being denied and we're not recognized that we are the first nation of this country. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Brian, before we hand back to Tori? Well, about this disability business. Yeah, I'd like to see, um, you know, I'm happy to work with first people with disability and, you know, I can go ahead and sit down and consult with my own people. Even though I tried back in the 80s with the uh, at the age of 30, starting starting from there when I gave up you know, all my alcohol problems and met up with my wife and we worked together for our people. And I like to see that uh, we need to bring everything together and to work. And first, we like to see that, uh, you know, how much money is going to come to, especially with the internal creed. You know, I'm not talking about only dark region, I'm talking about with people right around the, right around Australia, because the first people, not only the people that are disability in, in Australia now, it's the whole human race. I'm not, I'm not sure. Thank you so much, Brian. I just, I'm not sure if everyone can take notice of Brian's beautiful shirt. <laughs> um, Brian came into town from being out bush today to talk to everybody. Yeah and said to me, oh, Michelle, do you think I need to put on a shirt? And I said, oh, it's all right. <laughs> you come as you are. Yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is, which has been out bush for days yeah. and um, days, yeah. which is um, where you're most happy. Yeah. <laughs> you're wearing country, you're wearing that manu in your shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tori. Yeah, thanks, Uncle Brian, and um, also Michelle for um, yeah tuning in and um, for sharing your experience with um, with everybody here. I think um, I'll, most attendees um, are linked in with service providers in um, some shape or form, and um, I think it's important for us to um, hear um, stories from the ground um, and what what people are experiencing. So, thank you once again. Um, so if there's any other questions for, for Brian and um, Michelle and also um, Jeff, please feel free to send them through. We'll probably hang around for another five or ten minutes just if anyone's got some questions for people. Um, Scott Avery writes, thank you, Uncle Brian and Michelle, for sharing your stories. Uh, great seeing you. Uh, missing my trips to Tennant Creek, Scotty. So he sends his regards. Um, I think there was a question for, for Jeff um, from Angela Teasdale, who's one of um, the FPDN colleagues. Um, 
Jeff, she writes, uh, we are in 2020 and for so long we have considered that governments will close the gap. What can we do to put more pressure or collaborate with governments more to support for change to occur? Uh, the question comes from the context that people are tired of waiting for change. Tori, I think Brian gave us uh, a great bit of advice. He said, you've got to start at the beginning. You've got to find the beginning. You've got to have a starting point. Uh, and what you did, Brian, uh, with your wife was not only listen, but you took action. And then you tried to build something bigger with what you experienced. And I think if we concentrate on that gap and we keep talking always about the deficit, you know, what's wrong, what's broken, uh, the nightmare part of it, um, you miss what Brian has really done, which is to see, to love, to act, you know, to, to the smallest things we do, do build the change. Uh, you know, the change in the human story has taken thousands of years, but together um, we, equality seems sort of like a distant thing and closing the gap sometimes. I, I work with the Aboriginal medical group when that was a kind of a campaign, you know, the whole idea was how do we get the nation to realise what Brian has described, you know, um, people in a remote community, uh, people in a town like Tennant Creek as well, where they were not getting the same care and response as in other parts of the country. And why is that? And all of those other ways that people were measuring this gap or disadvantage um, the, the bigger change is there in, in that personal story. I, see, I think what Brian has shared with us is the story of the diabetes, renal illness epidemic, Brian. I think you've really given us a great understanding because that's how I react to it. You know, if you, if you only see the big picture, uh, you miss the person like Brian's uh, wife that he didn't just uh, see and then turn away he did everything he could uh, to bring well-being and you know he's also quite correct in saying look around the world and then you see the big picture so diabetes and renal illness 30 or 40 years ago you hardly heard of it in Aboriginal communities I'm sure Brian remembers that. I mean, really, when I was a very young journalist in the 60s, that's not what was going on in the remote community. People were still getting their water out of a 44-gallon drum. There weren't bores in every place. You know, babies would die of dehydration, so the loss of little babies was a major issue. It, what, we, what the doctors call infant mortality. But the diabetes, renal illness, is part of a global story, just like this pandemic. So rather than be terrified by that big picture, Brian's actually telling us uh, how to respond, I think. We've got to say to those within our family, within our reach, where does this come from? If Aboriginal people were, had the well-being that we know was there a couple of hundred years ago, what is it? in our diet and in our lifestyle and in our whole way we're living that actually created this story that around the world, it's one of the biggest damaging health impacts. And you, you know, it goes back to, I asked the same question as you, Brian, and a doctor wrote to me uh, from Melbourne. Um, his name was John Bertram, Dr. John Bertram. He was a professor and he worked out that that little baby in the, mother of, in the mother's belly, if her nutrition was not good, the baby's kidney didn't develop the same number of little filters and nephrons. And after the baby's born, doesn't matter what happens to her nutrition, that little girl will never get this catch up on what she missed out on because the mum's nutrition wasn't good. But you know, back in the day, Aboriginal people 
took such care of the pregnant young woman, you know, the mother having the baby, there were special ways of looking after the health. So it's not really new, but what is new is this is, a, this is another pandemic. I mean, uh, renal illness, uh, I've seen it in my own extended family. I, I, I know people that until their last breath went for dialysis. I see what a struggle it is to live changing blood like that and living on a machine. And, and I've, I know people like uh, the late Uncle Jimmy Little, who I was very close to, and we worked together on things, who had a kidney transplant because of this same pattern, you know, of the damage of renal illness. So the starting point to me, really, that's Brian's phrase, you know, where do you start? You've got to have a starting point. The starting point is the health of that mother and child and what we, the men, if we're the warriors, how do we go back to that way of saying, we've got to make sure our young women know this story that what you put into your body, it can be bad food, it can be, you know, grog, it can be smoking dope, all that stuff, all of the poisons around in the modern lifestyle. Don't give that little unborn baby the chance of health. And then you get it in great waves of it. So what they call the obesity epidemic is really another kind of pandemic. Uh, it's not a virus coming out of, you know, a bat or a crossover. It's, it's something in the way that we're living. So pick the issue as Brian says, that's how I look at it. Uh, and if we, if we work on the knowledge he understands um, where the, 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 the remedy, you know, where the, the recipe for good health is. It's, it's to make that young mum and the man that should be standing by her side and all of the others in the family see we look after her health, the child's health is better, and then you've got a chance. Things are still going to go wrong. You know, we're still going to have, we're, we're, we're not a robot, you know, we're a, we're a very complicated, living, intelligent creature, but we're not all going to have like, it's not going to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger with some, you know, uh, we're going to have things go wrong, but it's, it's giving the child the best possible start. We haven't done that in Australia. All of our children, they are all of our children. And if we work on that start, that's, to go to Brian, your phrase, you know, about where the starting point, the starting point to me is to see where this comes from. Because then you stop counting the numbers. I, I'm overhearing the Prime Minister every year give a list of things that are broken and wrong. I want to hear somebody in federal parliament that sees that child and says, if it were his child, what has to be put in place for that unborn baby to have the chance of physical and mental health, to speak their language, sing their song, and live in a decent place with the right kind of roof over their head. And, you know, we have all, we, you know, we're, we're such a talented country. Um, I think we also maybe through this pandemic will see the health of one is the health of the other. You can't just, turn away from these things and pretend it's somebody else's business. So the unfinished business that Brian has explained about what's missing in Tennant Creek or anywhere else, it's missing in the suburbs of Sydney. You know, I work with the elders very closely at Emerton and Mount Druitt, and they have the same chronic illnesses, Brian, as your mob, you know. Uh, you know, whether you go to Yuunda Moo or you go to Cabramatta or, or or um, uh, Campbelltown, um, you know, there are people that have got three or four serious illnesses and the disability overload of the disproportionate amount is because we haven't gone back to seeing the child and the needs and then just getting it done. I think we have to be patient like you have, Brian, you've worked all of these years at it. And I think we just make it our business. It's much more important than all of the things that distract us. Um, that's, the, that's what I was taught 
by Aboriginal people, to see the long, how will this country be for all of those generations to come? And how will the, our connectedness, you know, will we understand, could we be the generation that steps up, you know, and does these things? Why not? We know now what's got to be done uh, and we have to do it together. And I'm kind of hearing more people during the suffering of the pandemic recognize that we are a human family. Um, and maybe as people did during the bushfires, start to recognize that Aboriginal people have been telling the nation for a long time, the way we're living isn't the best way. Uh, maybe we've started to listen a little more because I think then you can see the simple things that we can all do. Thank you today, Brian, for, uh, it's good to meet you this way. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for your response. Um, Rose also writes, um, being an advocate for people living with a disability, how can I get or earn trust from First Nation people and advocating for them? Thank you so much, Jeff, you're inspiring. Thanks a lot. Is that to me, Tori, or? Uh, look, um, it's still about listening, really, but I want to draw from the story Brian shared and say, you've got to be hearing a man like Brian explain what is there. And then instead of seeing that it's someone else's role, blaming the federal government or the territory government or anyone else, you say, well, maybe I can respond. So the trust question for me started in the beginning with my mother's story. She said to her own father, it's wrong that the kids that she played with from the shanty couldn't go to school. No Aboriginal kid where she grew up was allowed to leave and enter the school. But I said, my own children taught me later that you, you just have to, first of all, hear what someone in the community is saying. My girl and boy, ask a particular Aboriginal teacher in a Northern Territory community, what could they do to help? And Lorraine, this teacher, wrote out a little list. And my wife and I didn't even know they were up to this, but the kids went about getting the things that Lorraine had on her list. And she used an old uh, shelter. It was just a tin shed, you know, a roof and a few posts and a bit of concrete. And, and started with those things, what you could call a preschool. It was just sitting out there in the bush, yarning, but the kids found Lorraine, what she asked and said was important. And I would take that story then to a big conference. Someone wanted me to talk about a book that I'd written. I said, no, 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 you're, you guys are publishers. What do you do with a small community where children don't have anything to read. I never get to tell their stories or study even at school in their language. What are you doing? And out of that stuff, out of that effort, really out of the advice of my children who had listened, some action happened and they created literacy programs and, you know, it grew into other, other places. So I think what the first people's disability network is demonstrating is, what we've got to do is come together somehow. That's the, the yarning part. Uh, this is very creative to, to have to do it in the middle of the pandemic, you know, through the internet and computers and things. But the more we actually come together and try to bring the stories like Brian to the front and all of the others, I didn't name the children who are in the detention centres that have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I know mothers and fathers that who have a child like that in their home and the kids can seem to the local police uncontrollable. They can punch holes in every wall in the house, but they have talent. They have strength. They have a side of their nature that can be so creative, uh, but they also have a part of what is going on in their brain 
that to them, they just can't understand what is making them do a lot of the things they do. Uh, I want somebody to hear that child. And that's what the first people's disability network can do. It can start to bring together all of the different kinds of expertise. You know, we need the very clever parent who says, I'll get a group of us together. Because that's what Brian's story demonstrates. You know, wherever we are, instead of saying, no, I, I can't go into town or I can't do this or I've got my hands full, you've got to kind of see that there is some way that you can contribute to, to that. And I think we will see the complexity that all of these things, these shades of, we'll call it disability, um, are in fact unique facets of that human being. And once we work out that's why that little boy is behaving that way, or it could be something a lot easier to act on. It could be as Brian was describing people in a wheelchair. I, I know from you know my artist friend, Daniel McDonald, that he as a person uh, that is labeled as disabled, see so many Aboriginal children in remote communities and thinks, well, where, where are the, the wheelchairs with the tough tyres that can handle the rough track? But Daniel didn't just kind of know about it. He's like Brian. He's like Tori. No, he's like Linda. He did something. So don't get lost in the misery of the Close the Gaps report and the litany of excuses from the government about, you know, what's not happening and what's not being done. I think it's more going on with the works, being, you know, being patient and don't count. Uh, Brian didn't count. He acted because that woman that he was the carer for was there to be cared for. And aren't we now doing that through the pandemic? We're, we're, we're reacting to the ones that need the care and the love and a lot of brilliant nurses and carers and people that um, are never appreciated in their work are doing amazing things. And so surely one by one, uh, we can do this. You know, we can find a way to um, try to hear, first of all, these individual stories. The network part of it, I saw succeed on several different areas. Uh, when I was a 60 Minutes reporter, I made one little film about a Down syndrome project where the parents took the children and there was a lady who recognised that these kids were struggling to communicate who they were, but they love music and dance. And the merrymakers, as they call that troupe, became very famous. They were like a big family. And they came from different parts of the state, different parts of the country. It spread around. But everyone who ever went to see them perform saw the joy in this group of human beings. And they were every kind of imaginable background and language and different. What the mob shared together were, were, was the struggle. Maybe that's what we're, we're really talking about today. It is a struggle. But um, it's the beautiful struggle that makes us human. Uh, I think we are the better for ourselves for, for being part of it. Uh, and I'm absolutely certain it does make the change, creating that bigger network of the, of the family. People will take notice of First People's Disability Network the message will go back to various parts of the community about where these conditions flow from in the longer story. They will influence the medical front that has to respond to those people. Hopefully in time, people in government will see that we are a community, you know, family, community, the whole society is really built up on making sure that every one of those people is, um, is seen. I, I think I, Brian put it perfectly, you know, that you can feel in Tennant Creek or if you're in one of the camps that I do know, um, you can feel 
that no one even knows you're there. They don't know who you are. Uh, the more effort we make with the network, you know, the, the bigger mob, I think we start to address that, uh, that question. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, June Raymond, Deputy CEO, um, just wrote to Jeff, Brian and Michelle, I'm so humble with your wise words today. Thank you from my heart and FP, FPD and team. Love, June. Um, yeah, so thanks to everybody for coming on and um, as panellists and Linda as well. Thank you for coming on as the Auslan interpreter. Um, that was some feedback from the last webinar that we've um, now implemented to ensure that it's um, accessible to as many people as possible. Um, yeah, so with that note, um, I'll yeah, just wrap it up here, guys. I don't think there's any more questions. So um, thank you once again, everybody, for coming on and um, attending. And um, thanks once again for all the panellists for sharing your expertise. Have a great week and um, we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Well, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.